50 years ago, the world seemed crazy, much like today. Wars, political strife, economic uncertainty, and aimless young people desperately searching for meaning in their lives. I was very much a part of that culture. And as expected, my life began to fall apart. I broke up with a girl I lived with for a year and a half after having two abortions. Was so depressed, I wanted to die every day for six months. Tried to commit suicide. My life was falling apart. A few months later, I walked into a little country church and experienced the presence of God for the first time in my life. I surrendered my life to Jesus and got radically saved. My new life of unquestioning obedience to God and facing my fears had begun. Having heard my ex-girlfriend was living with an artist in a houseboat on San Francisco Bay, I decided to go see her and tell her about Jesus. Paddling out to the boat in a tiny dinghy, I lost an oar. It was a serious mistake I couldn't fix. Blown by the wind and strong current, for 90 minutes I was completely out of control. No boat came near me on that cold spring day, and if the dinghy had capsized, I would have died of hypothermia. But I just read the stories of Jesus and his disciples and how they faced their fears on the Sea of Galilee. So I carefully knelt and surrendered to the will of God for my life. Now, 50 years later, it's a commitment I make every day. All right. It was very unique to have someone with me as before I got saved with a camera to be able to film all of that. So that was pretty extraordinary. I know most people didn't get that experience, but... You know, I got saved in a revival, guys, and it ruined me for anything less than that. You know, I appreciate everything that goes on. Um, Certainly today was awesome. I mean, Vanessa, Howard, uh, Aaron, uh, each person sharing and ministering was tremendous. But our hearts yearn for something that really would blast away a lot of the um, in-between stuff that we feel at times is happening in our life. And that's what a move of God does. And so I keep going back to that, even though it was 50 years ago, it was so demonstrative. It was so extraordinary. Um, And it's not memory lane. It's saying, God, I want you to be able to do what you want to do. And so in my own life, as was intimated, fear was a big deal from the very beginning. I'm two weeks in the Lord. I read the Gospels, Acts, Romans, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm now crossing San Francisco Bay in a little dinghy that's probably about this big for an hour and a half. And I'm, I'm in deep doo-doo is the Greek word for that. So I'm in trouble. I go from Sausalito to Berkeley in an hour and a half. And again, I had just read about uh, what Jesus did, calming the storm, etc. And so I very gingerly knelt in the boat and said, God, if you want, you know, you can either allow me to live in this or not. Um, There was no boats around. Um, If you did any math on what it would be like to fall in a very cold bay on a spring day uh, and no one's around, uh, you're done at that point. But I accepted, even at that point, that I was going to trust God. Now, that's been tested uh, every day, whether I like it or not, it's tested. Last time I was here, I mentioned that I'm claiming God's promises, and he promises that in this world, I'll have tribulation. And so every day I say, Lord, come on, you promised Come on, give it to me, give it to me. And so he is faithful to do that. But one of the things I've seen with uh, the Bible is that foundational things that took place uh, in the book of Genesis and in the book and the Gospels shape our lives. Um, meaning uh, my foundation of having to battle with fear shaped my Christian life. And literally because the kingdom of God is antithetical to what's happening on the planet, very often what you see is not what you should believe. Now, I could ask you, how many of you believe in God? I sensed it in the room. You just could sense it. (laughs) But let me ask you this. How many of you believe God? See, that's a lot different. James says the devil believes in God. Uh, But believing God, that's a whole different level. And that's challenged every moment. There's no backstage pass for that. You're not automatically grafted into that. I've got two grandkids, grandsons in the first row. 
William and Wesley. And Wesley is exercising extraordinary faith because at this moment, even as we speak, the 49ers are playing. And he had a big decision. Do I stay home with Satan and watch the 49ers? Or do I come to hear my grandpa? I'm only kidding. I love you. (laughs) I hope they win today too. Okay. But thank you, Wesley, for coming. And William... You're studly. William looks like he's about 20, but he's eight years old today, right now. It's extraordinary. He's actually 14. And then my beautiful wife, Susie, of course. You just can see the shafts of light just shining. But very often we say, well, what does revival look like? I mean, what does pre-revival look like? Here's a picture of pre-revival. That's pre-revival. These studly men and women... Um, the guy on the left there was the, the pastor that went with me to start the church in Tahoe. He was the biggest drug dealer in Yuba County. He was an army ranger in Vietnam. Um, he's a rough and tumble guy living in a commune in Timbuktu. About you know, 10 people living there. And uh, one day, a straight-laced Christian man named Jerry Russell came walking up the driveway I said, that's how Christian men walk. (laughs) And he walked up the driveway into that and said, I just want to come and share with you about Jesus. And he wound up leading them to the Lord, my beautiful wife, who was connected to them in some way, and I'm forgiven. I've forgiven her for that. No, she was part, she was not directly living there, but she would go there, and she wound up getting prayed over as well at that same time. Uh, The revival that came in a church called Smartsville, which we actually shot that video in that little church again, same place. There were six old ladies praying for a move of God. Jerry Russell, the man who was coming up to pastor the church, was a layman. He was a house painter. He was not a sophisticated, uh, Bible-trained, a seminary trained pastor. And so he would come up and was about to stop coming. He was done. And then revival came with 18 barefoot hippies lining the front of the church. Uh, Susie, one of them. And all of a sudden, God moved. And out of the six ladies, four of them left. (laughs) I said, you know what? That's not what I was looking for. (laughs) One of them even lived a few houses down in Smartsville, the entire revival, and never came to church. And we're talking flowing out of the building. If you'd preach, you'd stand like this, and there were bodies everywhere but she didn't come. Susie's grandma prayed for her, and she, um, she went to the elders, which was Jerry and another man, and said, I've got a granddaughter on drugs. And they prayed for Susie, and Susie got saved. Yes. And then one, one person, and then Susie's grandma had a stroke and wound up being in a rest home. We visited her for many years, but one lady of the six, Mrs. Carney, four foot nothing, would stand up once a month, you know, in the middle of all these young people. And she said, I just thank God for you young people. So the question is, that's what ultimately happened. That's one little smidgen of us. At that point, I'm in Tahoe on a church planning team. There's already a team in San Francisco and Sacramento, one going to San Diego. There's ministry houses. God moved and people got saved. There's Susie on the right. Go back to the last one, okay? So, So we see people. There, and I know a number of them, uh, but not everyone. I was already gone. Next slide, though, shows the number that, as I contacted different ones, about 49%, maybe you can't see that number, 49%, as we know, are still serving God. The others we don't know, they still may be. But that's 50 years ago. And when moves of God come, people get genuinely saved, and, and there's a permanency about that very often. Not always, but it does happen. And so um, when I crowd surfed out, here's a little photo of this, uh, October 7, 2018, um, I wasn't going off to sit in a second row and drool somewhere. I, I was going off into my next in God. And as I would say to people at that point, I'm going off to my next 20 years. I'm 73 now, but I have at least 20 more solid, clear thinking years to turn the world upside down for Jesus. 
Amen. Thank you for the handful. My mom is in the back row there. Just thank you, Mom, for that encouragement. You'll notice Sean Patterson is there. What did he do? We photoshopped Sean in at that point. No, only kidding, no. Sean was there. He was actually very concerned that I might not make the leap. And that's why he came out. And he said, you can see his face is filled with terror at that point, wondering what was going to happen. But what you don't know is that right outside the building, and I didn't know that either, until when I crowd surfed out, out this door and in the lobby, then I met Pastor Bob's son, Logan. And Logan came in and he said, let me show you this. And he showed me a video of what was happening outside the building that night. And here's a little video of it. Come on, stop a second, pause one second if you can. Can we, can we uh, dim these lights at, this, at that too big a thought? Simultaneously, I just want to, because it's already very dark, otherwise it'll be acapella. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, so let's try that video one more time. What? A little more volume. Wait, God, I cannot explain this. Okay, so this is Logan, you turn the lights up. Logan's going, God, sweet, I can't explain this. So that's his voice on there as we was watching. And Elon Musk and I have been very close for many years. And so Elon and I were talking about, wouldn't it be cool if the same night I crowd surfed out, if you had a little rocket that went off? And that was actually the first la launch land SpaceX flight that was successful from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Now, I say that to encourage us that we are diving into our future and God's saying, I believe in your future. Now, you know that God's no respecter of persons, right? So he doesn't perceive anyone as better than another. We're all his favorites. I have actually six of tied for first place grandsons, but I do have a favorite granddaughter. I only have one granddaughter. She's my favorite. And I tell her that. And so we are thinking, you know, in our future, it may not be clear what's going to happen. And let me assure you, your future is not clear. I don't care what you're thinking. I don't care what illusion you're under. You have no idea. The only access you have to your future is by faith. Because I have had a lot of things where, you know, I'm at Thunder Valley and I'm saying, do it, for, do it for daddy. And I'm believing, you know, that God's going to do this. That's only a metaphor. Don't get hung up on it. But I'm believing that this or that's going to happen and it doesn't happen. And what does that mean? It means um, I liked being on the throne and God was saying, it's time to go. And let's get me back on the throne. Let's get me being the one who determines what your future is going to be like. And so I believe that with all my heart. That is God's promise for us. Now, um, I'm working with my little phone here, which is going to be very exciting. My message today uh, is fear is a tell. Fear is a tell. A tell in poker, and I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly, is a change of a player's behavior that gives a clue to the player's hand. So it could be a, a smile, could be a wiggle, some kind of a look away, look down, whatever, some kind of a gesture. And, and if an intuitive person is watching it, they pick up on what that tell is. And they know he's either bluffing or he really has what he says he has. And so you can gain an advantage if you observe and understand the meaning of another player's tell. Um, there's an expression, poker face. That's where that comes from. Uh, Poker face, where you, you, a person's trying to bluff their way on, but an, an inadvertent tell gives away the farm as to what's happening. Now, fear is a tell that's birthed in hell. I made that up. If you want to write that down, it's a very <laughs> catchy expression. That's why Susie and I are opening up a hip-hop shop, because we feel we have a, an ability to communicate in the language of the age in a powerful way. And yet, fear is a nervous tick that the devil has. He can't help it. He's the most doomed person. He knows he's going to hell forever. There's no second shot. And so he lives with fear that's inordinate. And the best he can do is superimpose that on us. But that's his tell. And so when he superimposes fear on you, it's the exact opposite. Now, I'm not saying if you're you know, wanting to jump off a building and you think you can fly, that that's not a good time to have fear. That's a good time. 
But I'm talking about if you believe you're stepping out and, and obeying the God as best, uh, the God, any God, whoever it is. No, if you're obeying God and you believe with all your heart you are doing his will, then God wants you to know you're going to experience fear. That is a very normal experience for me. I have to fight fear every day. Paul said, without were fightings, within were? Without were fightings, within were? Fear. It's in the Bible. You guys should look it up. Okay. Without were fightings, within were fears. As a matter of fact, our weakness, you know, the Bible, Paul said, who is weak and I'm not weak. The greatest Christian who ever lived said, who is weak and I'm not weak. Weakness is the tell. Time to do. It's time to step up. That's our tell. You feel weak? Awesome. You feel inadequate? Oh, man, thank God. It's taken him months for you to fish all night, years, and you caught nothing, and then all of a sudden he's going, now is it, now is it. We met with our financial advisor this week by Zoom, and we only lost 20% of everything we have. That's awesome. We have $5 left. (laughs) But I noticed, even again, they're Christian men, and they're very sweet, very sincere. Uh, And uh, we began by just saying, you know, you guys have a hard job. Because we know they're reviewing everything for everybody. It's like not a great year for those people who have some investments. And so we prayed for them, encouraged them. And and they said, you know, no one has done that. We've had no one of all the people we're talking to that are as positive and exciting about, and we all are Christians because we know about our future. Some people are terrified about their future because they don't trust the one who holds their future. And let me say this to you. He wrote the script for your life. It's a great script. Don't give up before. Don't walk out on your movie. Thank you so much. Don't walk out on your movie until you trust God for its amazing ending. But I noticed at the end of it, he said to us, you know, this is an odd statement, but if you have any extra money that you want to invest, now is a good time. And so here comes this comment. And it was exactly right. This is the time. The market's lost 20%. This is the time. But it goes so contrary. Because in your brain, you're thinking, I just lost 20%. Now the guy's asking me to give. Hey, you know what? This is fun. Give some more. (laughs) But that is the irony of it. It's a low tide moment. It looked like when a tsunami's about to hit, what's happening on the shore? All the water's gone out. All you see is mud and tires and boots because something big is coming. Again, there may be a handful. Of, again, I know you believe in God, but we're going a little deeper today. We're looking for believing God. So I want to retool you to believe that fear is an awesome experience. Because the devil just gave away his hand. Oh my gosh, weakness, oh Lord, bring it. I wanna feel weaker. I know some of these sound like overstatements, but, and pray for Susie, that's all you can do right now. That's all you can do. (laughs) But I believe that with all my heart. I've seen it. I've seen the hand of God move. When I feel weakest, he shows up strong. That's God's promise to us. And, I'm, and again, I'm way behind in this message. So here are four lessons I've learned. Number one, God wants us to be unflappable. Unflappable. I can't take personal attacks personally. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. So my pastor, when Susie and I were saved in this revival, she got saved in 71, I got saved in 72. We did not know each other But we wound up getting married in 75, and that Christian community that you saw a picture of, which had been doing so great in 72, by 77, was not doing so well. People were sleeping with each other, a little smoky dopey in the rooms. You know, things were not happening like they once were. And so my pastor said, we need a new sheriff in town, because this place is going to seat here. The revival's over. And so would you go? And so he asked us, here's a slide there. He said, my pastor asked Susie and I uh, to live in, uh, and lead a community of 75 people. 14 were recovering heroin addicts. And he said it would it'd be six months, six to nine months. He said, uh, I told him, it's like asking Evil Knievel to teach Sunday school kids how to roller skate. I I literally, I said to him, (laughs) I said, Jerry, I want to empty hospitals. 
I don't want to squat among the sheep and scratch their wool. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Francis, the Bible doesn't say the Lord is my apostle, my evangelist, it says the Lord is my shepherd. And until you get a shepherd's heart, you're not going to go very far with God. I almost said my arrows in my forehead, oh my gosh, that's exactly right. I need a shepherd's heart. So I love people. I just didn't want to do boring things. <laughs> and at that point, the only models I have for pastoring were boring. And then we were there only for four and a half years, <laughs> six to nine months, 52 months to the day we were there. Now, again, I was a little cocky about it. You'd say, how long have you been here, Francis? I've been here for four years, two months, and th tonight at seven o'clock, three days. <laughs> so I was not enjoying the ride. I was not, getting, I was not getting all the mileage out of it possible, but I was learning a lot of things. I was learning to love people well, to listen, so I'd spend about six hours a day counseling people, people who were struggling with their various issues. Now, when I read the rules on that first night, there's a guy in the back going like this. I'm read I am the new sheriff. And there's a guy going. So the next day I had to ask him to leave. You know, you can't have two sheriffs. And uh, so as I'm walking away, if I ask him to leave with his family, it's unfortunate, it's sad, but the guy is a wild man. As I'm walking away, he's yelling, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to come back. I'm going to kill you. As I'm walking with my pastor, he's going, don't take it personally. <laughs> and so that's where that, that deal, just don't take it personally. That's his deal. Obviously, he didn't kill me. You guys pieced that together. But for, for a moment, I had to understand this is what I'm called to do. Now, Susie and I, again, they made us an incredible offer to be there, $50 a month. And God, you don't turn that down, okay? Let's be real. For four and a half years, $50 a month. You know, you, you say tithe, of course. You know, gives offerings to different people that invest in overseas bonds, liquidities. Just developing a portfolio. So later on, you'll have that. Okay, so when he yelled, I'm going to kill you, I thought of this verse. It said, Jesus said this, don't fear the man who can only kill your body. What could happen? He's going to kill you. I mean, he's only going to kill my body? I thought I was in trouble. <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you, I believe that. Why? Because he said it. If you don't believe it, you've you got to talk to him about that. He used the word only there. Apparently, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. If the God of the universe who made bodies said, mm, body comes, goes, whatever. What you really are looking for is your spirit to be rescued forever. That's a challenging verse right there, guys. Look at that. Try and do the math on that one. It's really quite challenging but simple. So in the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'll just say this to you very quickly. They were told, bow down or you die. Bow down or you will be killed. And so here's what they said. It's an amazing series of verses. I, I even numbered them, each comment. He says, you know what? We don't need to defend ourselves. King, we love you. We don't need to defend ourselves. Let's say you throw us in the blazing furnace. God's able. God's going to save us. He can rescue us from your power. But hey, listen, even if he doesn't, eh, no big deal. We want to make, let's make one thing clear. We want to make one thing clear. We will never, we're never going to serve your gods. Could you imagine the chutzpah in these little Jewish guys telling the king that? Every one of those comments was like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. they're all telling him, no, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to serve your gods. Do whatever you want. Give us your best shot. I'm not saying they were quite that cocky. I'm just saying they were speaking emphatically. We will not bow. We will not yield. We will not surrender. Number one, uh, and so Jesus will he will meet you in the fiery furnace. There's the fourth man. Uh, yesterday I was with Jackie, the street preacher, whom I love very much. Jackie, would you stand? I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. This great lady. And here's a picture of us together. Um, we were down in Cesar Chavez Plaza, and Jackie has an incredible ministry. She wants to start a church. Again, it's the most likely place to start a church in Cesar Chavez Plaza, with drug addicts and people that have you know, mental illness. Most of the people we met, at least initially, had definitely mental issues. Drugs are involved as well, but these are just poor folks that 
don't have all the chips working. And delivering prayer, watching just this great lady. It's so awesome to see a mighty woman of God just ministering intuitively, ministering to each individual, giving out food, sharing Jesus. And um, Jesus is with us. So that was kind of us three in the fiery furnace with Jesus. Now, in my own life, in facing fears, um, I had to, and I think it's the second slide, we have, we're fearlessness, being fearless. I don't know if I, I showed that. I have to face my fears or they won't go away. Don't be afraid of sudden fear. That's the challenge about fear. It comes on suddenly. So you're preparing your heart. I've got to face them and they won't go away. I grew up, for whatever reason, being afraid of the dark. My father literally had to sleep with a light on. Now, he was in the uh, original CIA, the OSS, during World War II, was in Sicily. He was Sicilian, born there, but then migrated here, and helped plan the Allied invasion, ironically, there as a young man. Uh, spent two years there. So he went through stuff. Who knows what he went through? But he always had to have a light on. And so for me, when I came to the Lord, even though I was a afraid at times of the dark. I mean, your mind plays tricks. What's that shadow, you know? Um, I remember knocking over a lamp. I thought it was a person. Anyway, some things that uh, you know I've got to deal with this. So I used to, I was an evangelist before. After that, four and a half years pastoring, I then was an evangelist for 18 years. And in the early 80s, 1980s, not 1880s, 1980s, I was traveling in Louisiana. And in Louisiana, in the woods, there's incredible amounts of critters. I mean, you just go by the woods, everything is just moving there. So there's animals, insects, you know, and it it's, can be intimidating. You would never go in there at night. But they put me in a parsonage on a, a large church property, and uh, I decided I'm alone in this parsonage. There's rooms I've never been in. Uh, it's a little bit musty. It has, you know, not every room has been used. But I decided one night I'm going to deal with my fear. So I walked around the entire house, opened doors I'd never been in, saw faintly beds there in the dark, turned no lights on, and then I put my hands underneath the bed. And I remember kneeling there and just saying, you know, I don't want to do this, but I'm doing it. Whatever crawly thing out is in there. Then I went into a closet, did my hands there. So I, had, I confronted fear. The way you deal with fear is you have to face it. You have to confront that tell. Otherwise, you go to hell. Okay, there's a little that rap again. It's just, it's just so fluid. It's hard to contain it at times. So, for me, and, and confronting this, I remember at one point, and Susie was a great help throughout. Let me say this. First of all, I even had a conversation with Susie about a week ago saying, honey, were you ever scared as we lived in this community for four and a half years with, um, and, and at a certain point, the only people coming were people from prison. Uh, it was, it was uh, probation departments sending us people who had served 10, 20 years in prison and they needed to place people. And so we became a placement for people who've been in prison many years. And so it was a very intense experience. And so um, Susie, again, would be that courageous soul. I asked her, honey, uh, were you nervous? She said, no. She said the same things that I would say. I was just trusting the Lord, that God had us there, that God had to protect us. We had no locks on our doors. We lived among them. They were 50 feet away in dorms or whatever were there. And so one night around three in the morning, I was very tired. Actually, I had been ministering to a family. A heroin addict had come to the Lord, but because of the drugs he had done, uh, he ultimately had died. And three in the morning, I got a phone call. So I picked it up, and I heard this, just, it, it's like a demonic entity in this voice. <sighs> this, is an, this is the uncle of the guy who died. I had never met him. He had gotten out of prison. He said, I'm going to kill you. When I see you tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. And so uh, when, when I was awake, I could face my fears. But now I'm awaking out of a dead sleep, and it just went right in. And all of a sudden, literally, my knees, my knees have never knocked before, but I'm standing there answering the phone, and my knees were literally knocking together. Um, but I resolved, as I went back to bed, and Susie held me and prayed for me, I resolved, I'm going to the funeral tomorrow. And I'm going to greet, I'm going to meet this guy there. I'm not going to be intimidated by this. So I stood outside, didn't know what he looked like, but I could see as he looked at me and 
what he looked like, that this was probably the guy. And so he came up and he cursed at me and I put my hand out. He slapped my hand away, cursed, went inside. But I had dealt with the point was I'm here, do whatever you want. I'm here. And I think the key is in life, are we willing to be here whatever happens? That's number three here. Uh, be impenetrable. Either God is able to protect me or I can't be protected. If God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, that's the reality. At some point in life, either God can protect you or you can't be protected. That's just the truth. I'm not saying be foolish. I'm saying you're walking in life. You know, being with, with Jackie yesterday, it's very refreshing, but it was really like an old shoe. I mean, yeah, this we were talking to drug dealers. We're talking to all kinds of folks. There was a, these are people, you know, crazy can show up at any given moment. But we're going to love on them. We're going to love on them. And ironically, a number of them had people who had prayed for them. An auntie who had prayed for them. And they're not doing well right now. They're selling drugs. They're not doing well. But prayers are still working. A perfect opportunity to share a testimony. And so Daniel is told, if he keeps praying with a window open, we're going to kill you because you're a Jew and you're praying to your God. And so people are watching, setting him up for it. In Daniel 6, when Daniel learned about this law that had been signed, he goes, you know what? Great time for prayer. I pray three times a day. Let's open the windows as usual and let, let everyone see. I, I'm unflappable. I will not be intimidated. And so he wound up trusting God. And what happens? God will meet you in the lion's den. Next slide. Oh, I guess I got to get all those things there. Okay, so God will meet you in the lion's den. So the thing is, he became a lion tamer. And so some, honestly, sometimes the people you think there's no way that God's going to touch that. Paul, the apostle, was not looking. He's likely. He kills Christians. Now, he probably is going to happen. I share this, next, this message next week at the Ukrainian church, the home of peace. Um, and it really was a setup. And, and let me say this to you. I don't preach that much anymore. I don't miss it that much anymore either, being candid about it. Um, but ironically, I have three speaking engagements in eight days. This message was birthed out of me speaking in Phoenix next week, this next Saturday, in a conference called Kick Fear in the Face by a mighty woman of God who wrote a book, podcast, etc., and where she's had to deal with fear. And so preparing this message, then I was asked to come share here. Then I was asked just two days ago to come share there. I'm going, wow, a trifecta. We have three messages in eight days all about fear. Hmm, wonder if there's a pattern. Wonder if somehow within, think anyone who has relatives in the Ukraine might be concerned about fear? I don't know, Francis, they're doing pretty good back there. This is the planet we're on, guys. And I will, I will guarantee you, it's going to be more challenging. Yeah. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. <laughs> Why? Because I'm trying to, I remember Havila, I didn't want to say her name, but I did. Havila was saying, <laughs> was engaged to Ben. And they are doing great. You know, both my daughters are amazing, have great husbands. But Ben was not stepping up at some point. So she, she just ran her hand and she said, honey, what, what's that? He goes, I don't know. She said, it's a spine. You can use it anytime you want to. Isn't that cool? I, that, that could be my favorite sentence of all in the history of the world. But he goes, oh, I guess I'll use it. So in reality, that's what God's called us to do. Now, among all these people, probably the, the most radical story uh, in pastoring was one of the guys who'd been in prison for many years. I'm in my office. Now, my office is in my house. It's right through a little door right next to my house. Our house was only 1,400 square feet, an old little house, and he's there. So I'm sharing with him, and uh, I'm trying to draw out his past, you know, to try and get him to surrender his life to Jesus. He's not a Christian. And he begins to convulse and share that he had killed six people. And this is with tears, and he's convulsing. He said, I blew my uncle through a window with a shotgun. I mean, he's, he's talking, and it's like he's emoting in a deep way. So it's just two of us in a very small room, and so I'm reaching out. I'm like, you know, trying to encourage him now, surrender your life to Jesus. And at one point, he just flared up. I mean, it, it, I was pressing too hard, 
and he put his fist through the wall next to my head. So I have sheetrock, and uh, that's not an actual photo. Many of you guys knew that. But the, the concept, he put, he was, and, and all of a sudden now I'm, it's game on here. This guy is a killer. My family's right inside. It's right 10 feet away. I've got kids, little girls. And so what are my options? So I beat him up. No, that's not the option. That wasn't the option. That wasn't even an option. So I leaned forward and I said, you can do whatever you want, but I will not be intimidated by you. Now the point, dead men can do that. They've done studies. You try and scare a dead man. He won't even look at you. Punch him in the face. Nothing. Jump on his chest. Eh. You guys are a tough crowd today. I'm trying to get you laughing a little bit. Something's hard. It's like I'm a lot of work up here. I'm sweating already. <laughs> so fear. Here's my fear equation. This may help you. It's simple math. Fear equation. Number one. Here's a verse, 2 Timothy 1. God has not given us spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Boom. Yeah. That's the spirit you have. You don't need more of it. The spirit of God doesn't come in increments. It does come with yieldedness in our hearts. Yeah. Right. So lately, God's been saying, Francis, step up. Come on, I got another gear. I got, another, I got something else I want to do. Step up. He's challenging me. I'm telling you, middle of the night, he's kicking me out of bed a lot. And he's saying, step up, step up. You got some more gears. You got some more levels. There's things I want to do with you. Same Holy Spirit I had from the time I got saved, but another dimension. That's the spirit of God you've been given. Power, love, and a sound mind. With that in mind, the Bible says there's no fear in love. God is love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. So if I'm giving into fear, it's because I don't, I'm not allowing God's love to permeate me. If you allow the love of Jesus to consume you, you don't care what people do. I don't care what you do. I mean, I would be sad if I was with, and I almost brought Wesley yesterday. Would you have wanted to go with me yesterday? What do you say? Next time, would you come with me next time? Okay. Is that a maybe? I hear maybe. <laughs> Leslie is very on it. Wesley, who's Leslie? His sister? No. <laughs> Perfect love. Cast out all fear. For fear has. To... Oh, look, go back. I, I was reading that second one. <laughs> For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. You think God wants to perfect you with love? You think God wants to make you fearless? Yes. Number three, with that sequence, if this is love, and this is love, not that we love God. It's not, you know, I love God, therefore it's the tipping point. No, he loves me. When the, when the boys were younger and I was pulling them across the street when they're three or four and holding their hand on a busy street, they may have been holding my hand. But the connectivity was not based on how strong their hands were. The connectivity was how hard I was holding them. They can go airborne, and they probably did, but it wouldn't make any difference. I got you. He's got us. It's not our love for him. It's his love for us. And then lastly, within that equation, the devil has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. So a liar is trying to intimidate you with fear. The God who is love tells you, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. He's saying that there is no fear in love, just receive more of my love and then you become fearless, unflappable, impenetrable. You allow the Holy Spirit to consume your life. And again, Jesus said, that can only kill your body. What's the big deal? Now, you'll ha you can face that at some point, and that'll be a great victory for you. Then lastly, unintimidated. Unintimidated. Now, I'm sorry, I'm going a little faster there. So fear, please do not feed fears. I saw that sign in Tahoe. It's had a B in it, though, but anyway. <laughs> Unintimidated, I will not be intimidated by the enemy. I will not be intimidated by the enemy. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies, the Bible says. 
I remember as a young Christian, Brother Andrew, who was called God's smuggler. I may have been a year in the Lord. And Brother Andrew, I remember he just, I never saw him live, just heard a, a message of his. And he said this one sentence. And he's a guy who smuggled in millions of Bibles in the most dangerous places on the planet. He said this, I only go to America when God tells me I have to. In America, the Christians are very comfortable. I only go to America when God tells me I have to. I remember as a, as a young Christian in America, I'm going, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. Now, again, I had a twin brother who was the crazy twin. I was the same twin. I grew up saying to Joseph, Joseph, don't, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. That's not going to end well. Do not do that. Now, he wound up leading a missions organization doing crazy things around the world for 40 years. But he was always, cra- I'm, I'm the timid, calm, sedate <laughs> twin. So, this man in the first row, Bob Hasty, he has the gift of going to places that are very crazy. And so he took me to Pakistan twice, against my will. (laughs) And it's no joke. You look up online, there's a little picture there of the most dangerous places on earth. And um, North Korea is one, two, Afghanistan, you may have heard of those. Uh, Somalia, Libya, and then Pakistan. So, Here's a little video, just as I'm going with him and just taking, going through a back alley, here's a video I shot, which will speak for itself. You can turn the lights out before you play the video. There's extra points. So the man in front of me walking who tried to shake the guard's hand who had a gun in it was Pastor Bob. (laughs) The guy wasn't ready to shake his hand. He probably wanted to. But in Pakistan, here's some slides just to kind of give you a glimpse. This is, you're going to see things you don't normally see. That's like going into a meeting. Find find your shoes after that. Uh, They do things with goats you don't normally see. Another picture, the guy who takes us with us who said, you go a block from the, hosp- from the hotel and share about Jesus, you might last one block, you'll be dead by the second. That's the guy, top left, Asif. They printed one of my books about racial reconciliation. And uh, I grow a beard to blend in, sit in back of cars. Uh, but the next slide, in, in Pakistan, the Christians are called the neverborns. They're 2% of the population. 
they don't exist. And so they are completely persecuted, completely non-existent to the ruling Muslim culture. Uh, their streets are like this, where you know you're getting close to a Christian community because you begin to smell human feces. And so their streets have sewers going through them. And obviously just being there, it is a very humbling experience to see the grace. I remember following this woman out, she spoke a little bit, and I just, that's her husband, I just followed her out trout down an alley, because I had, God gave me a word for her to encourage her. Next slide there, if you would. Um, I think about the verses that apply. This is a guy who had a rifle there guarding us. Who shall separate me from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. I just would say to you, if you're reading the Bible, don't just think it applies to people in other nations. We might be surprised what happens in America. Because the Bible was not just written for non-Americans. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, whatever, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Next one, Matthew. Blessed are those who are persecuted for, because of righteousness. Someone come to a keyboard, if you would, please. I'll see, how about Howard? That might be a good recommendation. <laughs> for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed, you're blessed. Wow, they insulted you? <sighs> you're blessed. Persecute you. Falsely say all kinds of evil against you. <sighs> you're blessed. <sighs> Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice there means to jump up and spin around without falling off the stage. That's what it means. Because great is your reward in heaven. We're going to heaven, right? Yeah. How many are going to heaven? Let's be candid. How many are going to heaven? Okay, okay. So this earth, this time on earth, is our shortest experience of eternal life. It's like, boop, our life is a vapor, a wind, the Bible says, that passes away. We're here a moment. Now, what happens on earth, I believe, shapes our direction in eternity. I think I talked about it last time. Great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets. One more slide. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. And the final picture, Pastor Bob and I being able to baptize different people in a hidden place there. This cost their lives. Their lives are daily in jeopardy. You know, I want to um, invite Pastor Bob up, please, if you would, and LaDonna. Um, you know, they personify, I wouldn't be going to Pakistan without Bob. <laughs> I'll be candid. And Bob wouldn't be going to Pakistan without LaDonna. <laughs> she, she's got to sign off on that one. Um, I've known Bob 30 and LaDonna for 35 years. And I've seen them morph from being, um, you know, pastors of a senior church. Actually, they were associates the first time I met them. And uh, in their 20s, I think, something like that, late 20s, at least you were. But just to see uh, the grace that is on their life to lead with courage in a time that requires fearlessness. Again, I wouldn't be going without them, without him. They just came back from Albania. Albania was considered at one point the most atheistic nation on earth. Ukraine, Iraq, Haiti. We went together to Ecuador in July. Pretty safe place comparatively. I'm going back with Bob again to Pakistan in January. He tricked me. <laughs> but they're printing a book, uh, Father Wounds, printing it, you know, and I'm thinking, do these guys have father issues? Duh. Can I get my little butt out of America? Yeah. So here's the point. 
in my hope in coming, and I want to pray over them, but we're going to then invite you to come. Uh, this is a great day to get free from fear. This is a great day to say, you know what? This is my fear issue, and I'm going to kill it today. I'm going to chop its little head off. But I'm telling you, you've got to confront your fear. It's not going away. Time does not heal. <laughs> it doesn't. There's no inscription in the Bible that says, and time heals. It doesn't say that. Jesus can heal. Now, some of you are going, man, this is really a low tide moment in the church globally, in the church nationally, in the church regionally. And I'll tell you, every pastor, you know, we went away. Uh, I went away with Sean and Amy just for a, a day, a couple weekends ago with other pastors and prayed over them and encouraged them. But it is a hard time. The vast majority of pastors, many of them would say, you know what, I'm, I'm done. Crazy. This is two Looney Tunes for me. I'm moving on. But I believe there's a next wave coming, guys. This is the time to buy in. This is the time to put your chips to the middle of the table and say, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm going in. You can call yourself Mrs. Carney if you want from now on and say, I'll be there standing when revival comes. I just thank God for all you, whatever. Because they're going to not look like you. They're not going to have your background. But they're going to be who God loves and cares about. So I want us to stand. And I want to invite my beautiful wife, Susie, to come. She loves coming up on the stage. That's her favorite thing. <laughs> Said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> and let me say this vicariously. It isn't like you guys could say, if only I could see someone modeling fearlessness, that I might do it. <laughs> oh, I, love, I love the expression from Mother Teresa. She said, you know, people said, should I come to Calcutta? She goes, find your own Calcutta. There's plenty of Calcuttas out there. There's nothing magical about Calcutta. Just the place that God calls you to. Your Calcutta may be Roseville, California. So we are going to pray. And uh, I want to bless them. Again, I love awkward. It's my favorite. <laughs> and Bob loves me to lay hands on him a lot. He's always wanting to hug me. And I say, Bob, I've hugged you four times today. <laughs> Stop. Stop. <laughs> So, Father, we thank you for this amazing couple. And again, there's no Bob without LaDonna, Lord. He'd, he, he'd be dead probably without LaDonna. But we thank you for them. Thank you for the virtue and the character that shines forth from their lives in such a beautiful way. We speak a blessing over them. We speak protection over them. We know Bob, he's got yes on his lips, Lord. Crazy does not bother him. Obedience is what he's about. And so we thank you for that. We just pray protection over them. We pray that they would be, even as Jesus, you were the first fruits of a new creation, that they'd be, continue to be, continue to be a first fruits of fearless ones that are willing to lay down their lives. If I live, I remember when they begged Paul in Acts. Don't go to Jerusalem. Every prophet says you're going to be in chains. And he says, why do you make me weep? Why do you make me weep? None of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear to myself, that I might finish my course with joy. And the, and the testimony I have received of the Lord, the gospel of the grace of God. So, Lord, we, we want to follow. I want to ski in this man's wake as best I can. And I honor him. We bless him and her today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's, let's give God a hand. Just stay where you are. Stay standing. Jackie, did you come? You know, I was with Jackie yesterday, and um, this is a fearless woman of God. I've got two beautiful daughters who are fearless as well. But um, I have just been honored. I've been honored to ski in your wake, my dear. Really, I'm honored. Yesterday, just watching you move, um, and, and your brother, who was with us, Jesse. who's probably watching right now, Jesse, yes. um, your brother said she can go from being very strong to being very soft 
instantly. And I thought, isn't that just like Jesus, that we could be strong? You know, she was breaking up fights. I mean, this, this woman is all in. I wouldn't mess with her. But the devil has found someone who is not intimidated. And so I want to bless her. And Susie and I got to spend a um, couple days with her and a number of intercessors a few weeks ago. And we hope to do that again next month. But I want to bless her. But then I want to invite you again to come, guys. We're going to pray. And I would like Jackie and Susie and LaDonna and Bob and I, we're going to just pray over you that you would kick fear in the face. That you would say, no, I will not bow. So, Father, we thank you. If you extend your hands, this is a great lady. This is a a woman who's going places. uh, There was no crowds of Christians trying to get into that park. And I found so many of the people, the, the people we talked with, so tender, so open. Even the drug dealer. I mean, it wasn't... You know, reaching out to them, loving on them, that they sense the genuineness of a caring heart. And so we thank you. That is the virtue, the character that is in uh, Jackie the street preacher, as she calls herself. And so we thank you for this next generation that are coming forward, that are going to be mighty, Lord. And we, as who are older ones, are going to ski in their wake, and we're going to honor them. I was happy to follow her yesterday. I felt safer following her lead. And so we ask your blessing on her and her team and those that would come out with her. Uh, We claim, even as she has a burden, to start a church in Cesar Chavez Plaza, an incredibly unlikely place. But Lord, would you honor that? Would you go before her in that? Would you keep her safe in that? As she just doesn't go down in daylight, she goes down at night. She goes down in the middle of the night. And she's willing to walk fearlessly in that. Keep her safe. Watch over her all the days of her life, Lord. But we honor our sister, Lord. We honor her for the virtue that is extended. And we claim this next generation will rise up. And I see it happening across America. It's only little fires here and there, but it's already happening, guys. There's already breakouts that are taking place. And, and they're going to have to grow in magnitude, and they will grow. But we want to be a part of that. We want the Rock of Roseville to be a part of that. Sacramento to be a part of that. So we ask your blessing now on our sister in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand if you would do that, please. Okay. Don't hesitate. Just come. Vanessa, would you come? We're going to sing that song. At one point, you mentioned about fear. Just come. My message is over. <laughs> this is your time with chutzpah come if you're afraid to come that means you're supposed to come I called Wesley and William this morning on their individual cell phones and said guys please come I believe God wants to speak to you today Okay, just close your eyes if you would and begin to just say, Lord, I trust you. I will not bow to fear. I don't care what they do to my body. I don't care if I care what they do to my body. I want to become a different person. I want to yield my life to you, spirit, soul, and body. I'm an eternal spirit being My life was hid with Christ in God. I will not fear the man or woman who could only kill my body. I will not fear the future that can look intimidating. I will not be afraid of finances. I will not be afraid of job security. I will not be afraid of health issues. I will not bow to fear. I bow to you alone by the power of your spirit. And so, Lord, I stand in your presence today. And I ask that you would move in my heart, move in removing every residue, every vestige of fear, every drop of insecurity. I reject it as a lie. You've not given me the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound, clear, strong mind. I claim it right now by the power of your spirit. 
Lord, I claim another generation is going to follow you, Lord. Another generation is going to be fearless. Lord, your word says the righteous are as bold as a lion, and a lion does not turn aside for any. So I thank you for the men and women, Lord, that are being raised up in this generation. I pray that you'd awaken their hearts to understand who they are. I pray for fearlessness to be their portion. In, in, an unpenetrable conviction to do your will, no matter what happens, Father, by the power of your spirit. Lord, you do what only you can do in each life here, Lord. Supernaturally, you do what only you can do, Lord, by the power of your spirit. You do what only you do, Lord, by the power of your spirit, Lord. Mighty God, supernatural God, we are not afraid. We're not intimidated by illness. We're not intimidated by, by financial insecurities. We are confident in you. We want to do your will. We want to go to the nations of the world as you call us to, Father. We want to do your will. We want to be fully surrendered, desperately surrendered for you by the power of your spirit.